Good morning. How are you all this beautiful, beautiful day? Good. Fine, too. Thank you for whoever said that. Who are, how are you? Um, yes, so kind of, this is the kind of day that reminds me of that uh, line from, I think it's from the Psalms, uh, or one of those uh, nearby books. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, right? It's one of those days that makes you feel, feel glad um, and thankful for all that God does for us. So glad you're here this morning. If you're a member of St. John, don't forget to fill out uh, one of these white cards. Let us know uh, that you worshiped with us this morning. Um, if you are a guest of, uh, of uh, here this morning, we're glad to have you and hope that you'll worship with us um, uh, again. And uh, in the back of the pew, somewhere near you, you'll find a blue card that says guest on it. We'd uh, be pleased if you would fill that out. And you can put the white one or the blue one in the uh, offering basket on the narthex on the way out. If you're a member of St. John's, don't forget to show your love and trust in God um, by uh, also returning an offering to him uh, to show him how thankful you are for all his blessings. Many years ago, I had a had a friend who was in the field of sales. And one time he told me that, uh, that he had been let go from his job because his boss said, you're not hungry enough. Wanted to see more, or more passion and more drive, I guess. Um, you know, we're all hungry for something, if you stop and think about it, right? And I don't just mean, you know, having brunch after church today or having donuts with the Bible class may be hungry for that too, but um, in life, we're hungry for something. Sometimes we don't recognize exactly what it is, you know, uh, but we know something is maybe not quite enough, we're missing something, we're hungry for something. Maybe it's success or popularity or control or money or what? What are you, what are you hungry for? That's what I'm asking you. This morning in our gospel, we'll hear about Jesus uh, feeding the 5,000. That's the common name for that story, Jesus feeds the 5,000. And of course, after a long day in church, so to speak, a long day of listening to Jesus, it was getting late and they actually were hungry. There were a lot of rumbling stomachs, I guess. And we'll hear how Jesus took care of that. But what I would like you to be thinking about today is what your hungry for besides lunch. And uh, do you think Jesus will take care of that need? Think about that, okay? In your hand should be a copy of this morning's order of worship. Let's, uh, let's begin our, our praise and worship of, uh, of Jesus, who is, as you may recall, the bread of life. <laughs>
Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gifts, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost is from Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. 
Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the epistle is from Ephesians, the second chapter. Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you, who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The apostles returned to Jesus and told them all they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, 
He looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Carol Rudy was uh, planning the annual Altar Guild picnic and uh, expecting maybe a dozen or 15, and lo and behold, 25 showed up, and she had only planned, you know, the salad and sandwiches for a smaller number. Quick, run to Myers and, and get stuff at the deli. So they're planning the church picnic for this year. That'll be great, won't it? We didn't, you didn't have one last year, because, well, you know why. It's going to be at wall camp on August 29th, so mark your calendars. And imagine they're, they've got the, the brats and the hamburgers on the grills, the pop is in the coolers, expecting maybe 100, 125, and, and then just imagine, all of a sudden, more people start coming, including some campers from around wall camp who smell the smoke of the, you know, the brats and the hamburgers. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, instead of 125, there's 200. Quick, run into Kingston. There's a Casey's there, and they can get more meat and buns and chips and pop. So imagine that you sign up with the Lutheran Association of Missionaries and Pilots to do a, one of their week-long VBS sessions way up in northern Alaska. They say, oh, there will be a couple dozen kids that will show up. So you've hauled in hot dogs and buns and watermelon and chips and lemonade for the end of the week closing program and picnic, and the people start coming and coming, and they keep coming. People from the surrounding towns and villages say they've heard about the program and, and, the, and the picnic, and, and so they're showing up in pickup trucks and on foot and even in kayaks. Some of them have been walking all afternoon or maybe all day. And finally, there are 500 people there, and there's no Myers for a 1,000 miles. What do you do? Why, well, trust Jesus, of course. When all else fails, when you've exhausted your own resources and abilities and ideas, then we turn to Christ, right? Jesus can absolutely handle this, right? Well, the miracle that we heard about in our gospel reading today would seem to suggest that, that he could handle that. By the way, did you know that that story that we typically call the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle of Jesus that's recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And each of them has a detail or two or three that is unique to the telling in that Gospel. And each one kind of enriches the story when you look at it through all four, uh, through the eyes of all four writers. They all say that a very large crowd had gathered. Interesting, the one, interestingly, the one we heard today from the gospel writer Mark is the only one that says that when Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he taught them many things. In fact, he kind of went on and on and on with them because, well, they had a lot to learn. There was a lot of needs there. They were hungry for what he had to say. And the day kind of was getting late. Mark says at the very end of the story that the number of people there was 5,000 men. 
interestingly, in the, in the culture of that time, it seems like they only counted the men. Matthew adds, besides women and children. So Mark was not using that number 5,000 men in the generic sense of 5,000 people, as we sometimes do, but it was literally 5,000 men plus women and children. So just imagine if each of those 5,000 men had a wife and just one child with them, well, then the total would have actually been more like 15,000 people. And as the day wears on, and maybe they hear some stomachs grumbling, you know, rumbling with the lateness of the time, the disciples kind of get close to Jesus, and they say, you know, Rabbi, it's, it's really time for everybody to go home for supper or to head into to find a village or a town or a farm nearby and get themselves some food. But Jesus says, you give them something to eat. John, in his record, says that Jesus was testing them because, spoiler alert, he already knew what he was planning to do. Well, predictably, the disciples begin calculating how much that's going to cost for them to give them all something to eat. One of them says, oh, that would cost 200 denarii. Well, we don't know exactly, you know, that doesn't ring a bell with us. What's that like, $200? Oh, no, no. A denarius was a working man's wage in that day and that culture. So let's just do some, some math. Let's kind of keep it simple. Let's say a person makes $1,000 a week or $4,000 a month, 200 denarii would be about eight months' wages. So eight months at $4,000 a month, $32,000 to feed 15,000 people. 32,000 divided by 15, $32,000 divided by 15,000 people is about $2.13 apiece. Pretty good price for catering. But the disciples were pretty sure Judas didn't have that much money in the money bag that he carried. And then the disciple Andrew says, well, here's a boy with five barley rolls and two small fish, but how far will that go with so many people? By the way, the little boy with the sack lunch is only mentioned in the Gospel of John. And think about it, even if everybody ate only, let's say, five ounces of food, that equals more than two tons of food altogether. Even if they could afford it, how would they haul all that food in to get it there? So, as you know, Jesus accepted the little boy's lunch, said a prayer, and said, start passing it out. Locks and bagels for everyone. And did you notice Mark says, they all ate and were satisfied. They could have as much as they wanted, which in those days was kind of unusual. A lot of people went hungry a lot. Plus, there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Now, here's my question. Do you think Jesus would do that for you? If you devoted yourself to him for hours and hours and hours, and you were off in, I don't know, some state park in the middle of nowhere, somewhere with him, and suddenly felt hungry, would Jesus feed you? What are you hungry for? What do you need 
right now in your life? What overwhelming obstacle or problem are you facing? What wilderness are you in miles and miles and miles away from any Myers? Are you ever disappointed with God? Has he let you down, failed you? Are you ever spiritually frustrated, even angry at God? You know, I think all too often we think if God is real, if he's truly omnipotent, if he really cares about me, he would do the miracle that I need. He should follow my plan. And that's kind of what the people thought that day when they all got miraculously fed. John says at the end of his account that those people, at least some of them, decided to make Jesus king by force. We'll make him king, they thought, and then every time we're hungry, ka -ching, bread and fish. And we think, to, as we hear that, oh, what were they thinking? But the problem is, it's kind of the same with us. When we have a problem, we want to see an instant answer. And frankly, an answer that's kind of spectacular would be nice. We're really kind of hoping for two tons of food. But we don't really need a two-ton miracle. In fact, do you know my way of thinking? Feeding the, let's call them feeding the 15,000, wasn't really a miracle of two tons. It was 15,000 five-ounce miracles. And everyone got what he or she needed. In our lives, we don't really need a two-ton miracle, only a five-ounce miracle. In the Lord's Prayer, you know, we pray, give us this, this day our daily bread, we're not asking for a year's supply of groceries delivered all at once. The problem is those five ounce miracles are easy to miss, even when they do come. You've probably heard the story of the man whose house was being surrounded by a flood and he climbed up on the roof to wait for rescue. And as he sat there, a tree that had, you know, been blown over or, or washed over or whatever comes drifting by, and there's another man clinging to it, and he says, get on this tree with me, and, and we'll float to safety. Well, that seemed kind of risky to the guy on the roof, so he says, no thanks, God will save me. A little, little while later, as the waters kept rising, a, a man passes by in a rowboat, and, and he offers to rescue him, but the rowboat seemed a little bit rickety, so the man said, no thanks, God will save me. And a little while after that, a, a helicopter comes, hovers right over the roof and drops down this rope ladder. But the man was kind of uncomfortable with heights, and so he said, no thanks, God will save me. The flood rose, and guess what? The man drowned. And when he got to heaven, and he stood before God, he said, God, why didn't you save me? And God said, who do you think sent the tree and the rowboat and the helicopter? But the man had been expecting a two-ton miracle, not a five-ounce miracle. And so, whether we see it or not, God is constantly sending us these five-ounce miracles. Maybe it's just someone who kind of shows up when we need a little encouragement or, or a, a little company, you know? Maybe it's a, just a minor error in the checkbook which all of a sudden leaves us with a little more cash than we thought we had. Or 
Maybe it's a phrase in a hymn that just kind of lifts us up or tells us something that we needed to hear at that moment. If we're paying attention, if we're not too distracted looking for a two-ton miracle, the five-ounce miracles are often there. You know, I remember one time some years ago when, to tell you the truth, I was good and mad at God. Things weren't going well at my church. I was frustrated, fed up, actually. Well, my son Jesse, who was maybe 10 or 12 at the time, reminded me that I had promised to take him to this pond that we knew of where there were tadpoles. And we had a little little pond in our backyard, and, and he wanted to have some tadpoles in the pond, and I had told him I would take him there. Now, these tadpoles that were in that larger pond, they, they kind of hovered around some rocks in the shallow waters along the edges of the pond. But every time I tried to get my net close to them to catch one, well, they would all dart out into the deeper water. And remember, I was in kind of a bad mood spiritually. So I prayed, God, can't you just make one of these tadpoles swim into my net? And I'm sitting on the bank, stewing about how hard my life is and how unfair God is. When another kid arrives at the pond, he's maybe eight or nine years old, and, and he takes his net and he swings a really big kathwack in the water. And, oh, great, I'm thinking, he's chasing all the tadpoles away. And Jesse strolls over to meet the kid and to check him out, and, and he comes back and he says, he's catching tadpoles too. Yeah, I say in my superior way, how many? Eight, Jesse says. So I used the other kid's method, and I went home with six. Now, you know, God could have sent a tadpole straight into my net, or maybe several. But instead, he sent a little boy to teach me a thing or two. Kind of reminds me of that little boy that we that was in that miracle, you know, in the Gospels, the kid with the sack lunch that gave it up in order to feed others. Well, that was kind of a little five-ounce miracle for me, wasn't it? In my dark, funky mood, I had one idea. God had a better one. I was looking for a big miracle. God sent a small one. St. Paul wrote to the Philippians, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Whether it's tomorrow's fish sandwich or tadpoles or whatever it is, God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? The feeding of the 5,000 or the 15,000, of course, is about God's ability, but it's also about our faith. Jesus tested his disciples with that question, where will we buy bread for all these people? Philip failed the test. Psh, that would take eight months' wages to feed them all. He counted the cost and said, can't be done. You know, a lot of times our faith fails too. Why is that? Well, maybe it's because, for one thing, we tend to confuse needs with wants. There's something that we want, and 
we think we need it, but of course, we really don't. And you know, a loving father doesn't give his child everything that that child wants. But we're like, God, all I asked for was a red Miata convertible. Was that too hard for you? Or maybe it's because we don't see the everyday five ounce miracles and so we assume they're not happening. Of course, that's why God gives us the scriptures where his miraculous power is revealed to remind us that he can and does actually do miracles. And then I think there's the possibility that we're kind of suspicious of God. Maybe it's because our priorities don't match his. Could it be that we're hungry for the wrong things? And when we don't get them, we just assume God couldn't do it. We're focused on our next McFish sandwich, and he's trying to get us interested in the bread of life. Maybe he's saying, you don't need lunch today. You need heaven. You need forgiveness. You need a new heart. You need me. Uh-huh, we say, just give me my McFish, thanks. But I think most of all, our faith fails because God simply doesn't play by our rules. We want to be in control of the game. We don't like God's solutions to our problems. I wonder how many people at back then, you know, 2,000 years ago at Galilee Fest said, ew, bread and fish? I hate bread and fish. They went hungry and were disappointed because God didn't provide what they wanted. God meets our needs, but we're not satisfied because we weren't in control. Well, we call this experience. Oh, God has failed me so many times. I just can't trust him. You know what that is, right? That's us playing power games. Well, I know you're hungry, and, and I don't mean for going out for brunch after church this morning. We're all hungry for something. You have some ache in your life, some emptiness that you're longing to have filled. And I want you to know, Jesus has loaves and fishes in his hands. He can supply all your needs. That is what he knows you really need. So, will you have lunch? Will you accept the blessing he offers? Will you take his five ounce miracle. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for your compassion shown in Christ Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep and the righteous son of David. Keep us trusting at all times in your providence where true satisfaction is found. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, that you have built one holy church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself as our cornerstone Grant unity to your church on earth through the work of your spirit 
and the faithful proclamation of Christ's reconciling cross as you tore down the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile in Christ, so heal all divisions of doctrine or pride on earth, even as your church is one before your throne. Grant us, Lord, to receive from you a new shepherd to lead and serve us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, that you have brought us from many families into the household of God. Continue to bless all Christian homes that fathers and mothers may faithfully lead their children by word and deed to call upon you as Father. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for our nation and its leaders. We ask your blessing on those who serve in civil office that we may enjoy good government in accord with your commandments. Help us to live in service to our neighbors while here, mindful that our true citizenship is in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for your constant care and all we need to support this body and life. Attend in mercy to those in need among us especially Wally Blumka, Barry Stull, and Christopher. Free them from dismay and fear by the certainty that Christ is their righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, who by his death has made satisfaction for our sins. Grant faith to all who come to his holy supper today, that we may eat his true body for the forgiveness of sins and be satisfied unto life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross 
and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
We rise to sing the Nunc Dimittis. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this beneficial gift. And we ask you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.